Let's Get Free is the name of the book. A Hip Hop Theory of Justice is a subtitle. The author, Georgetown Law Professor Paul Butler. Professor Butler, what's a hip hop theory of justice? A hip hop theory of justice is if you listen to hip hop, you're reminded that there are two and a half billion people locked up. You can watch all these reality shows about real housewives and all these movies about vampires and hobbits. And you'll never know that we lock up more people in the United States than any country in the history of the world. You can't listen to urban radio more than 30 minutes without being reminded of that fact. There are constant shout outs in hip hop culture to the brothers and sisters who are away, who are locked up, who we're not supposed to think about, who hip hop doesn't let us forget. So it's anything from Kendrick Lamar uh, wondering why of all the devastating drugs, and to him the worst is alcohol. He's got this song called Drink, which is about the devastation and the fun of being drunk. People wondering why we lock up people for selling weed. Weed is the hip-hop drug of choice. Marijuana is. They love it. So lots of questions about criminal law policy, how it is in the books and also on the streets. Lots of opinions about how we can be safer and freer if we listen to hip-hop. You know, the people who create hip-hop actually are perfectly situated to give us great criminal justice. There's this philosopher named John Rawls who talks about the best possible justice system being created by people who don't know who you're going to be in the world. So imagine you don't know whether you're black or white, Asian or Latino, gay or straight, immigrant or citizen. You make the best possible law, this philosopher Rawls says. With criminal justice, that's the hip hop nation. It consists of people who are most likely to be charged with crimes. Everybody knows that, young black men. But also people who are most likely to be victims of crime. So in their music, in their art, hip hop artists are laying down on tracks of what a criminal justice system will look like, what a justice system will look like if we treated everybody equally, treated everybody fairly, and wanted to keep the streets safe. So again, it's brilliant ground level reporting that nobody else is doing right now about the law on the books and in the streets. Does hip hop justice have any relationship to zero tolerance, three strikes, broken windows? Yeah, the art of hip hop is the remix. So what hip hop does is take all of these things that you read about in the newspaper, some people do and other people experience on the street, like stop and frisk, like three strikes and you're out, um, but also the classic philosophers. Kant, for example, talked about the importance of retribution, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Jay-Z has a song where he says, if you kill my dog, I'm gonna kill your hat, you're kill your cat. Same concept, this idea of equivalence. You know, when I started thinking about hip hop um, carefully, was around the time that I started being a law professor. And I practiced criminal law as a prosecutor for years, but I never really got into the theory until I started teaching. And I heard this conversation between these classic philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant and Snoop Dogg, on the other hand, and Lil' Kim, Nicki Minaj. They were saying the same things about the fairness of punishment, about who the society should select out to intentionally hurt. So, you know, people say you should write about the things that only you can write about. I didn't know anybody who was as well versed in both hip hop and criminal philosophy as me. And so, sure enough, all these concepts, again, this remix um, of Three Strikes, Bentham, and it comes out not just as interesting philosophy, but as brilliant art. Man. Tupac Shakur has a song about, it's called Dear Mama, and it's about his mom, who was a brilliant political activist, who for a while suffered from an addiction to drugs. His dad wasn't in the pictures, and the dope boys on the corner 
who helped raise him. They helped make him a man. So does hip hop consider current events? Yes. Uh, does it kind of put that through a wash of art and culture and history? It absolutely does. Paul Butler, you write, I became a prosecutor because I hate bullies. I stopped being a prosecutor because I hate bullies. So I grew up in Chicago and you can't, as a young black kid in Chicago, have a, a view, an idealistic, romantic view of the police as being your friends, as the guys who help you when your cat gets stuck in a tree. That's not how it was where I grew up. And when I went to law school, people thought that I was this kind of down for the cause brother who would come out and work for legal aid or be a public defender. But I'd heard that prosecutors had all this power and the way to make a change was to create change from the inside. So I went in as this kind of undercover brother who wanted to see what I could do from the inside. It didn't work. <laughs> what I found was that rather than change the system, the system changed me. It's not like I started on the first day calling the defendants all these kind of bad words that the prosecutors used to talk about the defendants. That took a while. But needless to say, in prosecutors' offices, defendants aren't held in high regard. So when you think about the things that I was concerned about, like unequal education, the lousy miseducation of a lot of our children, uh, broken homes, the kinds of things that make folks at risk for going to prison. In prosecutor offices, those are considered obstacles to winning your case. It's not that they're mean people who don't care about poverty and discrimination and income inequality, but it's not their job to think about the effect that those lights have on their defendants. What prosecutors do all day is to put people in prison. And again, I knew that going in, so it's amazing to me that I kind of got caught up in that mindset. Part of it is just lawyer culture. <laughs> We're competitive. We like to win. And the way that you move ahead in a prosecutor's office is to lock up as many people as you can for as long as you can. And unfortunately, I got caught up in that mindset. But fortunately, I got out. So now I call myself a recovering prosecutor. Recovering because I still like to point my finger at the bad guy. I still get upset when someone bullies somebody else. But what I said in the book is true. It turned out that prosecutors are people who are doing some of the most bullying because they have these very strict sentences. And they go to people who are accused and say, unless you plead guilty, I'm gonna throw the book at you. And you have some young people in those situations who might think that they have a case. You know, they know about their famous constitutional right to a jury trial. And they may think, okay, well, I wanna have my day in court. But man, if you're looking at 20 years in prison, if you go to trial and lose versus five years, if you just say you're guilty, Sometimes that five years can look awfully attractive given what the alternative is. Again, even for some folks who are innocent. So lots of concerns um, that I developed as a prosecutor. Uh, didn't have a lot of time to think about it though. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to start teaching and writing and be more thoughtful about the effect I was having locking up all these people and especially all of these folks who look like me. I was a young black man locking up young black men. And some of them deserve to be in prison. Don't wanna you know, have any rose colored glasses about that. But a lot of them really didn't. And at the end of the day, I had to ask myself, you know, did I go to Harvard Law School? Was I paying back thousands of dollars in loans to put my people in prison? And the answer for me was no. What, what switched your opinion? What, what flipped the switch? Well, there were a couple of like things, developments, just in terms of 
wondering why all of the defendants 